Well, our next speaker requires no introduction. He is one of the most famous Canadians, right up there with certain politicians and hockey players. Conrad Black. Thank you, Conrad. I understand you're going to sit. Uh, I, I would if I could. Yeah. Please. Choose a chair. Yeah. Okay. These are better lit. I think this one will be best. This one? Yeah. yeah. I'll turn it a bit too. This is it, Moses. I just start up. Off you go. There's a timer right there. Okay. <coughs> well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming. Um, my mandate today, as I understood it, is to address the question of the impact of technology on politics with particular influence on 24-hour news and the whole 24-7 news cycle. And uh, is that the cause of uh, excessive political contestation, especially the famous gridlock in the United States? And my theory is that it is not, and I'll, I'll tell you why, and I'll tell you what I think is, uh, but I hope you will indulge me in illustrating my point by taking us back 40 years. I promise not to mire us there for any longer than I need to, but it's central to the point I, I'm going to try to make. Uh, 40 years ago, the United States was in the midpoint of the Watergate crisis and had ostensibly concluded at least the American era of participation in the, in the terrible controversy of Vietnam. And I just want to remind you of a few aspects of that era, again, not, not to have a nostalgic talk, but just, just to set up the point I'm, I'm going to develop. <clears throat> Mr. Nixon was inaugurated, Richard Nixon, in 1969, and many, just looking casually at the audience, will remember and those that don't will certainly be aware anyway of just how difficult the conditions of the United States were at that time. There were 550,000 draftees in Vietnam, 200 to 400 were coming back in body bags every week. It was an undeclared war. It was not clear what the war aims were. It was clear from 1966 on that the government of North Vietnam would not facilitate an American withdrawal. They would not do anything to get the U.S. out. They had been offered, uh, they had been offered a phased withdrawal of all non-South Vietnamese forces from South Vietnam. And if Ho Chi Minh had wanted to win the war quickly, he would have taken that, waited until six months after the Americans had gone, and then reinvaded because the Americans were not going to go back there. But he wanted to defeat the United States. This is what Mr. Nixon had to deal with. There were no relations with China, no relations with the major Arab powers, no peace process, no substantive discussions in progress with the Soviet Union. Uh, there were riots everywhere, race riots and anti-war riots every week all around the country. The assassination of Martin Luther King, the assassination of Robert Kennedy, skyjackings. It was a terrible time. Four years later, Mr. Nixon had extracted the United States from Vietnam. There was still a non-communist government in Saigon. He'd signed the greatest arms control agreement in the history of the world with the Soviet Union. He'd opened relations with China. They'd begun a peace process in the Middle East. And uh, he founded the Environmental Protection Agency, stopped inflation, reduced the crime rate, and abolished the draft. And uh, incidentally, doubled the number of federal parks in the country because as a young man, his family was so poor, it was the only place they could take a holiday. Now, that was why he was re-elected by 18 million votes, a plurality that has never been matched before or since in the history of the United States. And he carried 49 states. That was why that happened, not because of any political skullduggery conducted on his behalf by the committee to re-elect the president. Now, when he was, uh, two months after he was re-inaugurated in the peace with the North Vietnamese and the other parties to that war was signed, his approval rating was well above 70%. And in the subsequent 15 months, it declined to the point 
I should take it a little further than that. No, but that's, that's right, about 15 months. It had declined to the point where uh, more than two-thirds of those who expressed an opinion, and in fact about 66% of the of respondents, uh, believed he should be impeached. Now, just let me remind you of the reasons for this I impeachment uh, finding. I I'm not going to read them at length, but just... If, I mean, I wrote a biography of, about him, and I followed the era closely, and even I was startled when I reread these things. The, the allegation was that President Nixon engaged personally and through his close subordinates and agents in a course of conduct or plan designed to delay, impede, and obstruct the investigation of such illegal entry, the Watergate uh, entry to cover up, conceal, and protect those responsible, and to conceal the existence and scope of their unlawful covert activities. The means used to implement this course of conduct or plan included one or more of the following. One or more. So it doesn't say how many. If only one, it doesn't say which one. Making false or misleading statements. Withholding relevant and material evidence approving counseling witnesses with respect to the giving of false or misleading statements, interfering or endeavoring to interfere with the conduct of investigations, obtaining the silence or influencing the testimony of witnesses, potential witnesses or individuals, endeavoring to misuse the Central Intelligence Agency, disseminating information received from officers of the Department of Justice, uh, to members of his administration to assist them in avoiding criminal liability, making or causing to be made false or misleading public statements for the purpose of deceiving the people of the United States into believing that a thorough and complete investigation had been conducted, endeavoring to cause prospective defendants and individuals duly tried and convicted to expect favored treatment. Article 2 that Mr. Nixon repeatedly engaged in conduct violating the constitutional rights of citizens, impairing the due and proper administration of justice and the conduct of lawful inquiries, or contravening the laws governing agencies of the executive branch and the purposes of these agencies. This conduct has included one or more of the following, that he acted personally and through his subordinates and agents, endeavored to obtain, considering current affairs, please enjoy this, obtained from the Internal Revenue Service in violation of the constitutional rights of citizens' confidential information contained in income tax returns for purposes not authorized by law, that he misused the FBI, the Secret Service, and other executive personnel in violence or disregard of the constitutional rights of citizens, uh, and that he has, acting personally and through his subordinates, etc., etc., um, and in disregard of the Constitution, authorized and permitted to be maintained a secret investigative unit within the office of the President, financed in part with money derived from campaign contributions, which unlawfully utilized the resources of the CIA, that he failed to take care that the laws were faithfully executed, uh, and in disregard of the rule of law, he knowingly misused the executive power by interfering with agencies of the executive branch. Article 3, which was a straight partisan vote, the Republicans came back on the reservation with this one, was that he had failed without lawful cause or excuse to produce papers and things as directed by duly authorized subpoenas issued by the Committee on the Judiciary of the House of Representatives on various states. Now, that, those were the three counts of impeachment. Let us just for a moment reflect on this. It doesn't really say what he's accused of doing. It throws all the spaghetti at the wall in the American manner and, and says that he did one or more of all of these things. Doesn't say which. In order to clear himself, he had to make the point that he was innocent of absolutely all of them. In point of fact, there was no evidence to support this. No believable evidence at all. The closest there was to any evidence was that he authorized a payment to Howard Hunt, whose wife had just died in a plane crash, and who had a, a large family, young children, uh, to, and it wasn't clear. It's not clear from the tapes in which this authorization is quite audible, or from any other source, 
what his motive was or what he expected to get from it other than to assist Howard Hunt to pay his legal bills, pay his household expenses, maintain his family in this terribly difficult time for him with his wife dead and him uh, facing prosecution. Now, as you will recall, some of you, the chief witness against him was John Dean, the White House counsel. This is completely unconstitutional and a legitimate legal proceeding in the United States. A man's lawyer can't testify against him, but he was able to in the hearings of the Congressional Committee because, uh, because they aren't bound by the same procedural rules as the U.S. court is. Not that American uh, court procedure is anything to write home about either. And, <laughs> and, and yet, this, this man who had, without a shadow of a doubt, one of the most successful presidential terms in the history of the country, rivaled, I submit, only by Abraham Lincoln's one full term and Franklin D. Roosevelt's first and third terms, this tr tremendously successful president, overwhelmingly reelected, uh, relatively quickly into his second term, facing the, this, this farrago of vague and implausible charges for which there was, in fact, no evidence, was facing a, a two-to-one poll against him on the issue of whether he should be impeached or not, which in practice meant impeached and removed from office. And the reason was because the media were, the national media were, were practically unanimous in their opposition to him, and he did undoubtedly mismanage the investigation. He, he certainly, for a man who was a long political survivor, and had a very sure instinct of survival, uh, it was inexplicable why he did mismanage it as he did, but that doesn't change the fact that there is no evidence against him. There is none today, and there was none then. And the impeachment of Richard Nixon was an outrage. Now, he resigned before it was actually voted. But the point that I w wish to make, and some of you have curious expressions in your face to be reassured that I want to make one, uh, <laughs> is that <clears throat> uh, I believe that there is a large body of opinion in the United States that feels that the national media betrayed and destroyed a distinguished president and a distinguished administration and they are very uneasy. If they wouldn't go as far as I just said, they are very uneasy about whether justice was done. And in addition, they are very uneasy about whether justice was done in the end on the Vietnam issue. Nixon had extracted the U.S. militarily, and he submitted the peace treaty that Henry Kissinger negotiated in Paris, though he negotiated it on instructions from the president whom he served. He submitted it to the Senate, even though the Constitution of the United States does not require that kind of an agreement to be submitted to the Senate. And he did so to get the Democratic-dominated Senate, the party opposing his own, to commit morally to enforce the treaty in the one way that the Americans could enforce it having left the war, and that was by airstrikes. In the great North Vietnamese Viet Cong offensive against South Vietnam, in the month between Mr. Nixon returning from China and going to Moscow in 1972, in, in uh, April of that year, uh, the South Vietnamese defeated the North Vietnamese and the Viet Cong on the ground without any ground assistance from the United States. But they had huge air support. And Nixon ordered a thousand airstrikes a day on North Vietnam and threatened to fire the Joint Chiefs of Staff if they didn't carry out the order and to make it clear that he was not bargaining away anything in Indochina uh, to achieve any uh, preferential treatment from either of the great communist powers, he increased it to 1,200 airstrikes a day when he was in the Soviet Union, every day that he was there. And when the negotiations became very intense at the end of the year, he raised it to 1,500 airstrikes a day when he was saying in negotiation that he would blast the North Vietnamese if they did not sign a peace, which South Vietnam was in fact refusing to sign, and threatening to abandon the South Vietnamese if they didn't sign it. Now, he managed to pull it together, get it signed, but he wanted 
the implicit assurance that American air power would be used against North Vietnam if they violated the treaty, which everyone expected them to do, and which, of course, they did do. Now, his executive authority evaporated over the Watergate issue. Uh, Vietnam was abandoned. He was chased from office. He took the decision that rather than fight it out, and he might conceivably have avoided a two-thirds vote against him in the Senate, rather than fight it out, he would resign, maintain his position that he had made mistakes but not committed crimes, and what has really happened is he has mobilized the puritanical conscience of America, which was aroused by his opponents to chase him out of office. He has mobilized it to gnaw at the consciousness of the American people, all those who are interested in the history of the country or have a conception of it and its modern development, on the issue of was he unfairly treated. And of course, he was unfairly treated. And in my opinion, that is why the network newscasts now are completely vapid. No one watches them. Rush Limbo has 27 million listeners. Uh, all sorts of, of people whose views are well out of the mainstream on each side have astonishing numbers of listeners and readers. And you have a civil war in the American media which actually, uh, actually and accurately reflects a, a sharp and unusually profound division in American public policy thinking. And the reason, I think, is because a large, large section of the public feels that they were let down by the national media, which has done nothing but shower itself with Pulitzer Prizes and other awards and congratulations ever since. And at the same time, a great many of them feel that the great effort in Indochina was betrayed. The 57,000 Americans who died, the hundreds of thousands of South Vietnamese who died, including hundreds of thousands who were massacred when the North won, the millions in the Cambodian killing fields, the very large numbers of boat people, they were all betrayed and it wasn't necessary. And in any case, the media should not be congratulating themselves for it. And they call it, some people do, culture wars, which is an expression, as many of you would know, goes back to Bismarck's Germany and his attack on the Roman Catholic Church and the Lutheran Church, which is a preposterous episode to invoke in regard to what's going on in the United States now. Now, other countries have other reasons for a kind of dysfunctionalism. In large parts of Western Europe, they paid for historically notorious reasons far too much Danegeld and social benefit to uh, the working class and the small farmers, and, and the bill has come, and the day of reckoning has come. They delayed it for a while, many of them by filing a false prospectus on their assets as they piled into the Eurozone and exploited Germany's desire to be in a cocoon of friendly states because Germany did not wish to run any risk anymore of being thought of as a hostile and unworkable country. It wanted friendly, like-minded countries around it on all sides and it was prepared to pay for it, but it's not prepared to pay indefinitely and it's not paying the bills anymore, at least not on that scale. That's a different type of problem. In the United States, I believe what I just said is the problem. And apart from the Halcyon era of Ronald Reagan, who was a remarkably adept president and a very successful president, there has been terrible awkwardness in the United States politically. Uh, in the Carter era, uh, even in the Clinton era, it was absolute nonsense to send his peccadilloes to the Senate for an impeachment trial. They were tawdry and so forth, but that has nothing to do with his ability to serve out that office. And, uh, and of course, it's got much worse under George W. Bush and the current president. And I think in this country, we have a relatively serene political climate because of the decline of the importance of the separatists in Quebec and because China and India putting up six to 10% economic growth rates has created advantageous sellers and producers markets for practically all of our base metals, precious metals, energy, and forest products. In the United States, there is that problem, and the country is going to have to address it, because as of now, public discourse is essentially idiots on right and left shrieking at each other and making no sense at all. And you don't get the best candidates running for president. In that terrible year, 1968, and I shall end on this, that I mentioned, and many of you remember, Awful though it was, at one time or another, Lyndon Johnson, Hubert Humphrey, Robert Kennedy, Nelson Rockefeller, Richard Nixon, and Ronald Reagan all ran for president. 
in this last year, you did not have the strongest Republicans running. The president was vulnerable, but he wasn't vulnerable to a candidate like Romney. He was vulnerable to a strong candidate. And it didn't happen, and that's very unusual in American history, and it's disquieting for those interested in the United States. So my point is technology, in fact, has absolutely nothing to do with a gridlock and dysfunctional politics, at least as we can witness it in our you know, most conspicuous instance of it in the neighboring country that most Canadians watch to some degree. Uh, technology isn't the answer. The answer is rooted in modern American history. And I may add that Mr. Nixon had the last laugh. He made the greatest comeback of all, and all indicators, including the sales of my own book about him, show that Americans are more interested in him than any other president in their history, not excluding Lincoln and Washington. Thank you very much. Conrad, stay there, stay there for a minute. Were you able to listen to the talk by Michael Nakula, the one who came just before? Yeah, uh, hmm? yeah, I spoke to him a bit while we were outside, and I did hear about half of it, yes. And, and, and he explained you, his idea to me when we were do speaking. Do you believe that the Internet is a game changer for politics on a worldwide basis? Uh, I, I believe it has to be, but I'm not sure it would be quite in the way that he has in mind. I mean, it's just so profound a change in everything else, the way we shop and inform ourselves and so on. I, 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 I'm, I'm sure that he's right. I'm just not sure that, it, that he's right in a way that will make him the next prime minister. <laughs> not with 4,000 members. <laughs> well, you've got to start somewhere. I mean. <laughs> and then there is the talk by Mr. Bell. So he appeared to me to be endorsing a kind of platonic, benevolent authoritarianism. Does that appeal to you as a political system? No, because uh, it, it's, no matter how benevolent the person ultimately exercising the authority, those acting in that person's name are undoubtedly, to a large extent, going to abuse their position. Uh, the trouble with benevolent dictatorship is it is always very hard on the civil rights of people. Even a great man like Ataturk, no one could dispute that he was a benevolent dictator, and goodness knows when we take a look at Turkey today, there's more nostalgia for him than ever. But, uh, but, it, it, but it was still an authoritarian government that, that just ran roughshod over people at the, at the level of the average person meeting the person he dealt with. The average person doesn't deal with the president of the country. So, I, no, I don't think so. I, w I do want to say this. It is, even though I didn't meet him and I didn't hear him, it is a privilege to be on the same program with Daniel Bell. I read his Cultural Contradictions of Capitalism 35 years ago, and indeed I used it as, uh, as the basis of an address I gave for, for an honorary degree convocation when I was on that circuit. And uh, I, I thought he was prophetic then, and I think much of what he predicted has come to pass. Therefore... Are we left with the Winston Churchill observation? Our system is still, on balance, the best one available? And not only is it better than all the others, as he said, I believe, the worst except for all the others, uh, but capitalism is still the best system because it is the only one that is conformable to the almost universal ambition for more. The problem is the desire for more leads people to excessive and even sociopathic things. So you have to use a democratic system to curb capitalism without strangling the motivations that capitalism legitimately inspires. And I think we're actually, for all the problems, given what human nature is, doing rather a good job of it in this country. I mean, goodness knows there's lots of room for improvement, but I think we're doing relatively well. The Germans are doing quite well, and they've had much more difficult problems, obviously, to deal with than we have, and it's not a rich country like this. Uh, so it can be, the South Koreans are doing very well. I mean, you can do it, you, you, uh, and you, no society, like any individual, none is perfect, but I think we're doing quite well. I think that's a happy note on which to end. Thank you, Conrad. Thanks very much. <laughs>